Good morning. We've got a lot uh, we could be talking about today. I sure hope it ends up becoming a lot. There's certainly plenty of material here from uh, Sarah Song's little summary of multiculturalism for us to talk about. Um, but I also wanted to check in with everyone here as we we're getting started um, about papers. Um, I want to make sure everything is kind of clear about what, what's going on this week. Uh, if everyone does have questions about, say, response papers or getting in late work, those are, pro those are probably the two uh, biggest, uh, most salient um, talking points, I guess, for finishing off the quarter. Um, chat, how are, how are things going there? Do you have any questions uh, that you can anticipate about how we're, we're intending to finish things off this week? I do, uh, while you're typing things on, oh, some, oh, 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 uh, I guess there was some miscommunication here about, um, things from my weekend update email, so yeah, 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 uh, I'm sorry, I might have, um, there might have been some, uh, typo things, I was doing all the weekend updates together, and there were some parts that I repeated between uh, the different emails. Um, my other two classes have their final on Friday, so that maybe is where, where I made a mistake in sending out our weekend update email. But just to clarify and confirm, um, our class is scheduled for Wednesday at 9.30 to 11.30, I believe. Um, so I'm, I am using our official finals period as a, a extra seminar uh, for the multiculturalism topic. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping we can we can make good use of that time too. There's a ton of stuff going on in this multiculturalism thing. So I thought having just a day to talk about it would just not be adequate, especially if we wanted to talk about some other stuff regarding the papers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's when Wednesday is, whoa, someone tried to mute me. Um, Yes, uh, Wednesday is our last official class, uh, and there was some confusion too when I was saying it was mandatory. Mm -hmm. I am not talking about meeting on campus. There is no way that's going to be happening. I just wanted to indicate that it is great. It's a graded attendance, just like all the other ones. Um, and if you can't show up live, um, although I really want you to show up live, because uh, I want this this unit to be m way more conversational, like I was saying last week. Um, uh, it, if you please do show up live if you at all possibly can, um, but I will be recording it and posting it on YouTube just like I've done for all of these. Is that does that clear it up? Yep. Okay. Cool. So um, I do want to just report that I had not a definitely not a majority, but there's a good chunk of students in the class who have not turned in their uh, term paper yet. So I, I sent out an email to everyone about who's in that kind of boat. Um, and uh, if, you, if you are in that boat, then that means you didn't get a response paper to work on. I didn't put you into the pool of exchanges. Um, so it's not game over yet. Um, we still got some time here. Uh, and what I said in the weekend update email is that I'm planning on doing another paper exchange on Tuesday, maybe Tuesday afternoon, evening, sometime in there. Uh, I'll, I'll take late papers and ones that weren't turned in on time and do the exchange, uh, do another round of exchanges so that you can do the, the response paper. And both of those are required for completing the class. So uh, you're going to need to get a paper to respond to to be able to do the response paper. So that's why that's a little crucial here. That's why there's some some pressure on that. Um, so if if you need to talk to me, please do it <laughs> today or tomorrow. Um, hopefully today, if we can get on the phone today to talk about what's going on with your term paper, um, try to get that in. Um, getting something in is going to be pretty important so that we can get you finished for the end of the term. Um, and and I like I said in the email I sent out to everybody who didn't turn something in time. I know some of you have already been talking to me, um, and we're trying to make a plan about that. And if you haven't talked to me, please do check in with me about it, um, if, especially if there's any chance that you're not going to be able to get your paper in by Tuesday. Um, so, uh, anyone have questions about that? Who's in chat this morning?
not seeing anything. Mark's typing something. If you have any questions about the response paper too, I want to uh, answer any questions you've got about that. Uh, this is a good time since you, you got me right here. I can answer your questions directly. And chances are if you've got a question about the response paper, then uh, other people will as well. Uh, do we get to read the response paper? Absolutely. So after the response papers are turned in, I will scrub them of electronic and literal textual references to your identity um, and uh, send them back out just like I did with the anonymous papers, uh, the original exchange. Where are the instructions again? So the instructions are in Canvas and I think I attach them to an email too. Um, I think the weekend update email or the email I sent out where after I sent out all the drafts or all the all the term papers I was like here's here's the instructions again for your convenience um, they are uh, yeah, yeah. Is, has anyone read read the instructions for the response paper yeah yeah were they pretty clear did, did any questions pop up cool I got my response paper, but I must have glossed over the instructions. Okay, okay. That's okay. I, they're, they're there for you. I would definitely take a look at the instructions sooner rather than later if you haven't yet, so that you kind of know what you're dealing with, um, and that if you do have any questions, we've got time to get you answers to them. Do we have to be in disagreement with the paper we're responding to? No. Not necessarily. In fact, there's good chance, I mean, it can go either way, right? You, someone can present something to you and you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm on board, I'm on your side. Or, no, I don't like this, right? So, maybe I can, I can talk a little bit about the response papers here, just to, like, underscore some things. The first thing that is absolutely the number one thing to be emphasizing for this assignment, in terms of doing it in, in the way that it's intended, is that this is not a peer review like you might do for an English class. Uh, like workshopping a paper or something like that. Your your comments should not be talking about things related to paper craft, like just writing papers, like grammar stuff, um, transition sentences, all that, all that kind of uh, craft of just writing a paper. I don't want you commenting on that. Um, so not not related to craft, but your your job is to evaluate the ideas. You're doing a review of arguments, not necessarily the essay itself. Um, certainly, there could be a little, there could be some gray area here. Like, let's say there are some clarity issues. If you weren't able to understand an argument that someone was presenting, um, I mean, that could be as much a note for like what would show up in an English peer review as much as an intellectual issue like this idea is not defined or it's ambiguous between a couple different options or something like that. That would be fair. I mean, to, to talk about which things need to be more developed or you can describe like, I think you're saying this, but I'm, it's, it's useful feedback to know like there might be some intellectual ambiguity going on with something that the, the paper is up to. But the main job is to be evaluating the arguments as best you can. So which are what arguments? It's a critical evaluation, and so that gets me to the second point that's related to your question, Kiana. Um, what is a critical evaluation? Well, it's just evaluating it for better and for worse. So it doesn't necessarily mean disagreement. Criticism is not always I disagree with you, or I think the logic of this argument is flawed. It can also be about uh, articulating what is working or what is effective. Being able to spot the good and the bad is what a critical thinker does. You know, you could you could imagine making two mistakes as a as a critical thinker. One is, of course, missing problems. Like if there's some problems with a reason with reasoning, like uh, logical mistakes or blind spots or 
false premises or things like that. I mean, that uh, disputing the claims that the, the speaker is making, those sorts of things absolutely count as being critical, and it would be a mistake to miss them, right? Or or also to pull your punches in your response paper. Like, don't put lipstick on a pig. If, there, if there's a problem with something, point it out, right? Or if you can see a potential objection or a potential problem, you could do that even if you agree with the paper. Even if you're basically on their side, you could be like, well, here's where the defense of this position, which I agree with you about, which I'm sympathetic with, is maybe falling a little short or could be improved upon. But the other mistake that a critical thinker could make is if they miss acknowledging something that's good. So just like missing acknowledging something that's problematic, you might miss recognizing something that's legitimate or casting something as illegitimate when it in fact is legitimate or downplaying the strengths of a position. Um, those are also critical mistakes that you want to be protecting against. So in your review, being able to identify what is legit and good is also a part of the project. Um, definitely in philosophy, there's a little bit more attention that's given on problems rather than uh, the things that are like working. Um, but mostly because that's where like, you know, the, the stuff that's that is working or that is legitimate um, frequently doesn't need a whole lot of commentary to draw it out, although sometimes that is required. Um, sometimes it, it is it's easy to miss something that is some legitimate insight. But a lot of times we put the emphasis on the critical part because that's where the conversation goes next, how we can like refine our understanding or push push the debate forward it does happen through the sort of negative criticism stuff. Am I answering your question, Kiana? I mean, the, the short answer is you do not have to be in disagreement with the paper you're responding to. But whether you agree or disagree, a critical evaluation is important. You might even use it, take like uh, after you read the paper, uh, you might like take your own pulse about where your sympathies are. Are you sort of naturally or intuitively sympathetic with the person's position or sort of naturally opposed to it? And depending on which side you're on, that might be useful to be aware of so that you make sure that you do the stuff on the other side. So what I mean by that is, let's say you are naturally antagonistic toward the position. You're like, I really disagree with this position. Um, so mo most of the things that are going to pop out to you are all the problems, right? That would explain why you are in such disagreement with it. But you might be trying to look especially, like say with charity, like you're supposed to be doing with your opponents in your own paper, be looking for charity of like what is what is a strong argument that the person has to defend their side like what are the things that are legitimate that you wouldn't want to dispute um, but you're going to dispute other things to kind of try to get for get a get a, a hold of your blind spots and do something about that um, if you are naturally sympathetic or in agreement with the paper that you're responding to then you might take it as all the more um, important for you to be looking at where can this argument be improved and try to have charity for your mutual opponent you know you and the and the and the author are on the same side here and then because the opponent is not in the discussion you've got to kind of generate stuff for them as much as possible just like the author all of you had to do with your own papers to try to anticipate where your opponents could be coming from what concerns could they put on the table um, if you're the reviewer sympathetic with the original article, you may still want to play some devil's advocate here to, to try to improve the defense. I mean, that's the whole point of trying to anticipate objections from the opponent. It's not just for sh making a show of being fair or impartial or something like that. It's because it actually does contribute to making the argument stronger if you can head some of the objections off at the pass, right? You anticipate them and then give adequate responses to them. Uh, any any other questions people have in chat about the response paper and, and how to go about this? How are we doing? Cool. Okay. You know, on this last 
bit of, few points I've been making. Um, I model I model this assignment. I do this with a lot of my classes, doing this response paper sort of thing, and I'm modeling it off of the way philosophy conferences usually go with professional philosophers. Like someone, every time you go to see a talk at a philosophy conference, you know, someone will have their whole presentation. They're usually presenting ideas related to a paper that they're working on, uh, that they're looking to publish, uh, or maybe a book or something like that. Um, and they'll present all their arguments, you know, make their case. Um, and then there'll always be some prepared responder that the conference, that the, the people that are hosting the conference, you may be grad students or something like that, or, or other professionals in the field, there's someone who's been assigned that person's paper. So they've gotten access to their presentation prior to the conference and um, have prepared remarks, kind of like a second opinion. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've seen the responder kind of open up with something like, I'm, I'm broadly sympathetic with what uh, this person is up to argumentatively, and, and uh, you know I think they're making really good points about this. They're adding this kind of important stuff to the discussion or helping propel the conversation. But <laughs> you know, and then they try to try to say, hey, where where could things be improved, or what are some other ideas that really deserve to be engaged with when it comes to the controversy that the person is trying to tackle. Um, so you can definitely do that if if you're if you find yourself in that boat of of being mostly in agreement with the person who, who wrote the paper. Just try to make sure when you're um, you know listing all the things that you like that it's not just kind of only a rehearsal of like thumbs up from me. <laughs> you know, try to make it critical in the sense of accountable. Like give your reasons or your arguments. Um, try to articulate what it is that you think is so useful or powerful or insightful about what it is that you're in agreement with rather than just sort of registering your vote you know it's still want you still want it to be a matter of analysis and evaluation I think I gave um, a metaphor before of uh, like being a movie reviewer where to be a good movie reviewer you need to be able to identify what is the good and the bad in a movie um, but you're going to still be arguing for that, wh like why I agree with something, why I disagree with something, why I think this is so good, why I think this is problematic, that kind of thing. Okay, anything else from chat? Anything else you want to ask about? Anything confusing? Oh, dang it. I wanted to do this in the first couple minutes, and I forgot. So in some ways, and I, I might just be preaching to the choir because everyone here is already here. Uh, but I was uh, disappointed <laughs> by. Uh, no, maybe I'll save this at the end. I'll save this at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that'll that'll make more sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I won't. I will. I'll, I'll save this one for later. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't even brought it up. Because now you're like, whoa, what does Jim have in mind? What does he want to say? Disappointed. Uh. Um, yeah, I'll save it for the very end. Yeah, and like I said, it's probably not anyone who is here right now. <laughs> okay. So, my main uh, agenda or ambition for our class time to today was to talk about Sarah Song's little summary of the debate around multiculturalism. And there's a lot going on here. I mean, um, I really like the way that she decided to structure this little article as, as like a survey. Um, she first talks about the kind of reasons um, that are behind or the motiv the motivations and arguments behind why some kind of embracing of multiculturalism is important or at least what are the things that are sort of morally at stake here about why this issue matters and that whatever response we make in terms of questions of social justice and how we decide to design the systems of cooperation that is a society, what are they going to say about the multicultural facet of that choice? Um, there, there are some things we want to have on the radar in terms of things that are potentially morally significant of why it matters. And so the whole first half of the article is all about that, these justifications for multiculturalism. And then she goes on to talk about the kinds of uh, critiques or concerns that people have with some of the approaches for how to do this. So between the positive arguments and the negative arguments, you get to sort of populate 
the whole field of the debate. Very good thing to do, even when you're um, presenting uh, a much more like opinionated proposal like you're doing in your term papers. I mean, uh, Song's uh, article is really just kind of a summary of the state of the field, uh, or you know, some of the highlights from it, um, rather than arguing for anything in particular. Um, uh, there are there's there's a philosopher in particular. It seems I, I was able to kind of read between the lines that it seems like Song is maybe a fan of, but um, you know the purpose of this article was not to argue for something as much as to frame a debate. And I think uh, I, and I think she did a fantastic job of that. Um, and why I give it to you as an officially assigned reading? Uh, I, like I said in the weekend update email, I think this topic is one of the most important and crucial ones. Um, th that's kind of my, my two cents. I, I think the multiculturalism topic, uh, I knew from the beginning of the quarter that this is something I absolutely needed to get into the curriculum because it, it seems to me to be one of the most pressing um, controversies in deciding, in sort of resolving all of our issues and disagreements about uh, what a just society looks like, um, how, how we should move forward into the future and try to have a more moral society um, and and how to govern it right there's lots of issues especially for America America is very diverse um, and Bellevue College is actually fairly diverse in my experience being a teacher here I've taught at a few different places and been a student at a few different places and um, I'm always just uh, astounded at, at how how many uh, different directions people are coming from and having in different circumstances that they're in um, different types of, of obstacles or dilemmas that they have to face um, this I was so happy to get this patch this is a new patch for the, I made I made this hat you can see it's got the uh, paper uh, the safety pins to hold it on but um, you know I've been wearing this hat all quarter and it's a it's from Star Trek so I'm a, you know it's also a Star Trek thing but I, I've mentioned before what it means um, it stands for a aspect of Vulcan philosophy, uh, which is a fictional race slash culture in, in Star Trek. But it stands for IDIC, Infinite Diversity in Infinite Combinations. And this is, you know, how to handle that, um, how to present a model of society that em embraces diversity has always been a theme of Star Trek from the very beginning. Um, in how people can be working together uh, in a collaborative, cooperative system, like a like a little mini society, like the spaceship where everyone's on is like a little mini society. How do they tackle these things, and then how they engage with other cultures and and deal with issues of cultural diversity and disagreement? Um, I think it's a really, really, really important question, and and not just because I'm a Star Trek fan. <laughs> Star Trek's just a kind of popular uh, expression of Putting, putting a spotlight on this and, and also looking at it at not just in terms of what are the problems, but what can the solutions look like. And that's why I really like doing this, this unit with you. Um, I think the thing in terms of framing it, the thing that shows up at the very end of the article, is, uh, one of the ideas from the very end of the article is maybe a good one to be starting with and thinking about this question. Um, a lot of the disputes or disagreements that happen come from how you answer the question what does fair integration look like so if we we have diversity as a premise like that's just happening diversity is happening um, but we're, we're still going to be some kind of society how should society be structured in light of that diversity what in other words what kind of ethical and moral significance should be given to diversity in terms of informing what that social cooperation should look like and uh, and especially for it to happen in a fair way and uh, think about America as a context here integration of diversity is a theme that has been a part of every aspect of American history here even before um, even before uh, European colonists arrived, right, and you got the the 13 colonies and the the uh, Revolutionary War and Declaration of Independence and blah 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 blah. Even before that, there's a lot of diversity happening on the continent, right? Um, 
and lots of different ways in which societies emerge. Like um, native cultures in North America were not all the same type, and they had very diverse social structures, um, very elaborate, some of them very elaborate and, and nuanced, um, and disagreed with each other and had to find ways um, to mediate those disagreements and happen in a lot of different ways. I, I recommend uh, studying uh, Native American cultures um, because they're not all the same. But this has been a theme throughout the entire history of this continent, when humans' presence on this continent, our existence here. And uh, the, the integration has happened in a lot of different ways, not always w ones that treated diversity as something attractive or to be celebrated or affirmed. You know, their integration can happen at the point of a sword or a gun um, or take um, immigration. Um, people coming to America that come from other cultures and other places, that assimilation is an idea of like, oh, that's what you're, you need to assimilate. Um, I talked with my neighbors a lot about this. <laughs> They're from the Philippines, and we talk about that. Uh, we have we've had those conversations um, casually many many times about so that 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 integration is going to happen in some way seems kind of inevitable, but that's not the question. The question is what's a fair or just way of accomplishing that integration? And something like coercive force seems clearly not appropriate. But there can also be concerns with, uh, there can be debate about, like, how much are you supposed to be, let's say you are um, an immigrant, um, how much are you supposed to be just kind of taking this policy of one in Rome do as the Romans do, like Americans, their rules, I just got to play by their rules, and how much should you maybe not be doing that? Or how much should the American social system itself, whether that's through the government or through the culture, again, thinking about John Stuart Mill's On Liberty emphasis about how cultures can have just as much of a regulating force as a government can, how should they be inviting people to participate in their society? How much should they be accommodating of diversity? Or, or in what ways to do that? That's what you see going on in this debate in this article is like all the sticky stuff that's happening there. And there's even more sticky stuff that, you know, even this article is not capable, it's not an exhaustive account of everything that we could possibly disagree about here, but it gives you kind of an introduction or a framework to what are some of maybe the principal concerns um, that people are considering. So that's a little bit of setup for the discussion. As I mentioned on Friday, I'm really interested in hearing um, you know all the usual stuff about clarification consensus controversy what your how your sort of reactions to the paper went but also just your own ideas of either what are the concerns you have on your radar what kinds of proposals for solutions that you think are appropriate just anything that's that is what are the things that are on your radar that pop up as being relevant to these questions of how to have an integrated society that is also premised on an acknowledgement of the incredible amount of diversity that happens between us. So I'm, I, I definitely was like, come to class prepared to talk. And I want to open up some space here and see what you would like to talk about. So especially if you've got some clarification questions for different sections of the paper, I'm, I'm prepared to try to help explain what Sarah Song was talking about in those sections or how some of those arguments work. Um, but there's so much going on, I'm definitely not planning on just doing a linear lecture about all of it. I mean, I've, I've got all these notes prepared, but <laughs> I want to follow your lead and what was sort of interesting to you. So uh, right now, Mark is the biggest person who's participating mm -hmm. in the chat, and I definitely encourage you to uh, keep throwing stuff down, Mark, but I'd love to hear from as many of you as possible. So um, did anyone have anything ready to go, ready to copy and paste and drop right into the conversation? If you got that, drop it in, or if you're coming up with something on the fly, let's get some in. Anthony says, I want to know more about where the post-colonial view comes from. What do you mean by where it comes from? Are you talking like it's uh, intellectual history? 
like tracing the line of thought of post-colonialism. Yeah? Okay. Um, there, this could be a big tangent, um, and I, I think it'd be more interesting to, to just kind of look at the content of what it's offering rather than a big breakdown. Maybe I could I could ask you, Anthony, because it, it'd be a big story to tell the, the whole thing here, but um, what why, why would it matter to you? Like, what would... Um, why would you want to hear this story? What would you do with it if if you got it? Maybe that could help me know what to focus on in in trying to answer that very big question. Thank you, Mark and Hayden, for dropping something in here. Um, while while Anthony's type, I want to kind of pick up on Anthony's thread here before I switch gears to something different. Give more charity to the ideas such as a critique of multiculturalism from the post-colonial perspective. Okay, okay. Um, are you saying, Anthony, that you're kind of initially disposed against it and you're kind of like, maybe I'm missing something? Thank you, Neha. I, I'll, I'll try to get to all of your stuff. Hmm. Something along those lines, Anthony says. Okay. Um, like I said, this is a really big story, um, but I'll try to give you some some kind of quick quick summary of where post-colonialism thought comes from. I'd say the story begins with the Enlightenment uh, and liberalism, which you've seen a lot of the sort of seeds of, you've gotten some exposure to that in the curriculum this quarter. Um, but one thing that definitely characterized the Enlightenment period, or the early modern period, where this, these ideas are first developing, is a huge amount of enthusiasm toward reason, critical thinking, as being able to solve a lot of dilemmas that we have, including especially moral ones and political ones, you know, the moral aspect to politics. Um, so there is a, um, a way in which humans and their function as reasoners was given a lot of attention as like a, a basket to be putting our eggs into. Post-enlightenment in the 19th century, you've got a lot of other kind of intellectual movements happening, but I'll just pick out one of them. I think the if you've ever heard of Romanticism, Romanticism was kind of a backlash or a, a counter response to the enthusiasm that the Enlightenment has for reason, and sort of saying, like, reason is not the fundamental way in which um, humans operate, or where meaning is to be found. It has much more to do with the passions. So a kind of skepticism about the ability for us to reason about universals and things like that. And I think the, the, that gave rise to some postmodern forms of philosophy that are really skeptical about objectivity, universality, um, they're putting much more emphasis on contingencies, um, and they're also skeptical about how, and this is where you start getting the post-colonial stuff going on, um, that those, that kind of skepticism about the Enlightenment and universal justice and stuff like that extends also, it sort of combines or is alchemically combined with um, this just basic recognition of the injustices of the colonial era, which happens around the same time as the Enlightenment. I mean, it was happening before that, and and I would argue, maybe I should turn my hat for this one, I would argue that colonialism is not a product of the Enlightenment as much as it's a tradition or legacy that survives through the Enlightenment movement in philosophy. Um, even though Enlightenment philosophers are sharply critical of this, as, as we've talked about before. I mean, liberal, liberal philosophy is not really giving you a intellectual or theoretical justification for colonialism, even though some people try to like twist it into something like that. Um, it, I think the biggest thing is that a, a skepticism that reason is capable of liberating us from this, that it, it sort of... Some people would take the, the historical line that it had its try and it failed. 
So we got to do something different, something um, more, maybe more extreme, um, or a phrase you hear all the time, I hear it all the time, is you cannot dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. And sometimes the tools of uh, the Enlightenment um, or liberalism are seen as the tools that were also a part of the oppression that colonial um, agents were like using to oppress others. Okay, so there, there's definitely some tension here about how you take it. But the post colonials are are sort of they got both of those things going on. So they they share with say Enlightenment thinkers a rejection of the injustices of colonialism as a political model or schema um, but they they are they don't think that or they have less confidence that the tools of liberalism or the enlightenment are going to be where we find the solution to that um, and they they also have a lot of these postmodern colorings with them too like um, uh, skepticism about a, a un trying to make a universal culture uh, or that the the pursuit of truth seeking through rational means is itself a kind of culture which is a theme that you see throughout this article right that um, there there isn't any way to structure a society which doesn't have its own culture connected with it like when like one of them said liberalism itself is a culture right so responding to that those concerns that's a little bit of is this helping at all for what you were wondering Anthony in terms of like tracing some of the the intellectual uh, ancestors of something like post-colonial theory. There, most post-colonialists have a, a lot of connection with postmodern theory. Yeah, this is helping. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times the what you think about post-colonialism depends a lot about what you think about postmodernism and or, and the its sort of modern opponent. There, there was a, around the same time period in the 19th century too. You really got these two different branches of philosophy that start diverging from each other in the Western world. One of them is called the analytic, the analytic tradition. The other one's called the continental tradition. And the continental tradition definitely moves more in the lines of postmodernism, flirting, if not directly endorsing things like relativism, skepticism toward reason, objective truth, universal judgment things like that can i explain postmodernism woo <laughs> yeah anthony yeah i mean some of those guys have interesting ideas like foucault bolrodard yep definitely uh derrida is another big one um sartre is in the mix there too um the these are uh, there's a um what is it uh foucault and I'm, i think i mentioned this before foucault and noam chomsky have a really famous televised debate um, where that are, they're very much like the representatives, uh, what's going on here philosophically, intellectually. Uh, Chomsky's kind of the analytic philosopher, the liberal, the the product of the Enlightenment, and Foucault is kind of like the the postmodern, um, postcolonialist sort of uh, thinker that is in opposition to this, and they're both really talking about issues of justice but in very different ways like um, Chomsky wants there to be a kind of uh, revitalization of enlightenment values that the the story of history is that we've failed to live up to our ideals that doesn't mean the ideals are wrong we just need to be executing on them um, in a better way it's like it's our failure not the failure of the philosophy so to speak whereas Foucault is like yeah, I, we gotta just burn it all down. <laughs> we gotta burn down all of the the sort of intellectual baggage of modernism uh, in order to create something different. And the, I highly recommend watching the debate. It's on YouTube. You can you can see it. Foucault versus Chomsky. Very fascinating. A great way to to kind of get uh, some representative ideas uh, of where where the lines are drawn on this. Um, Explaining postmodernism is really, really tough, but I, I've given you some of the seeds of it right here. Skepticism about reason, skepticism about universal objective truth, um, emphasis on contingencies, um, 
uh, definitely postmodernism is a different flavor of, of what intellectual rigor looks like. Um, they're, they're, it's a little bit more metaphorical um, rather than the analytic tradition or the modernists, which have a little bit more of a like logical or scientific kind of style of, of handling critical rigor. Um, yeah. In a way, this contrast reminds me of the Reformation versus Revolution argument that's constantly happening in Marxist circles. Absolutely. Um, and this has been a question f for as long as there's been injustice. There's a, a question, do you burn it all down or do you try to fix it from within? Another great um, historical example of that same kind of debate is between Emerson and Thoreau. Um, both of them are very critical of dominant American society and culture in the 19th century, but they run in different directions with it. Emerson is like, you got to lean into society here and reform it. And Thoreau is like, abandon, <laughs> abandon ship, right? Go off and, you know, make your life off the grid kind of thing. Or maybe be more antagonistically disposed towards society. Yeah. Okay, let me let me jump back to some of these other uh, comments that were dropped into the chat as we were going. Thank you again, everyone who's participating. Really appreciate that. This is what's going to make this better. Um, Hayden says, I thought that song article was very interesting, especially how she talked about how cultures can work together. Yeah, and that's a real question is like, not just can it happen, but how should it happen? I mean, it can happen through oppression. That, that I think, is a, a very interesting point to acknowledge. Not that that's a, a real live option for what could be moral, but just to recognize that functionally, oppression does create um, conformity. I mean, it, even if you're being coerced or forced into participating, you can be brought to participate. I mean, that's that's how that's the thing I've been kind of emphasizing about this uh, theoretical lens that sees a society as a system of cooperation. Saying that it's a system of cooperation doesn't mean it might not be doing like uh, establishing that cooperation through unjust means. Question is, what is the just way to go about it? I think that's a great way to frame this whole debate. Okay, and then um, Mark says. Does diversity eventually lead to integration toward the dominant culture, regardless of whether by peaceful means or by force? Um, I kind of am looking to have some clarification from you about this question, Mark. Um, so what, it, what would it be about diversity leading? So are you saying the dominant culture inevitably is going to co-op any um, any kind of revolutionary diversity, anything that's deviant from the, the, that cultural norm, it w it is always going to sort of exert this hegemonic force. You may hear that word a lot in this discussion. The hegemony, um, the way in which elements that seem to be attacking or threatening the dominant culture can be sort of absorbed or diffused and brought into that dominant culture. Um, is is that what are you basically asking? Should we be fatalistic about reform here? That the dominant culture is always going to win? Yeah, that is that's what you're sort of thinking. Um, so I can't pronounce on this. <laughs> I don't have all the answers for everybody, but um, I think the real question is. Why would you think that that would be true, and why might you think that that would be false? I think one thing we could definitely say is set up here is that it's absolutely possible uh, that this force can happen, where something that seems to be a um, threatening element um, can get absorbed in a, in a way that it diffuses its power to actually cause real change. I think there are plenty of historical examples where this doesn't happen, that a revolution is actually affected, or that it changes what's going on, or that even when the dominant culture tries to absorb this thing, it's not able to retain exactly what it was running before, um, but it is modified in the process. It's changed in the process too. So even if it's able to diffuse the biggest threat of how this you know countercultural force is moving, that it can't put it off forever. 
In fact, this is Marx's idea about capitalism. Capitalism, he thinks, is incredibly powerful in being able to exert this hegemonic influence against any competing element. But he thinks it's ultimately all of its efforts are doomed to failure, like we were talking about last week. I, I described uh, Marx's um, metaphor of the the capitalist system as a dying patient, that we can do things to try to prolong its life, but the eventual outcome is inevitable. Um, that kind of thing. Marx said, okay. Oh, man, time is just blown by. I didn't realize how fast it's. I'm going to try to get into the video what um, people have been dropping in the in the comments here uh, to try to get as much of it as possible. And then we've got another two-hour session to talk about this more. So if we didn't address your point fully or adequately, save it. Copy and paste it back in uh, when we meet together on Wednesday, and, and let's keep discussing it. I'm... I'm very encouraged by uh, how much action is happening in the chat right now. Niha said, will mul multiculturalism increase or decrease social cohesion? Because people tend to group with others that look similar to them, have similar experiences, etc. This was a major point that was a part of one of the critiques that Sarah Song discusses in her article about um, uh, how there, the, the contrast between the progressive left versus the cultural left, mm -hmm. which may ring some bells for our contemporary time here. Um, and the concern, the objection to multiculturalism is that it, multiculturalism does involve this kind of decrease in social cohesion or conformity, and that that's really required if we're going to be able to make strides in dealing with the ine unjust inequalities that are sort of premised on class um, or that involve economic disparity. That if we're going to change the way society functions in a way that deals with these class issues or economic inequality, we're going to need to be kind of coming together about that. And the emphasis on, on um, a, a politics of recognition that emphasizes the differences between these groups and lets people kind of play by their own rules to a certain extent, um, that receive that kind of accommodation, that they're not required to participate uh, on, along the same terms that other groups are in society that we're kind of all doing something different but that's going to threaten that I think this is a question and a one that I'd like to hear what you think about it so do you think that it necessarily decreases social cohesion or what are the ways in which as, as song emphasizes is there the possibility of, of some overlap here some way in which these can be mutually beneficial that the projects of dealing with inequality around class mm -hmm. or economic disparity are actually going to overlap with our efforts at dealing with cultural inequalities or other kinds of social inequalities um, do 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 uh, Hayden is talking about one good example is World War II, where the capitalist West was forced to work with the communist Russians in World War II. Yeah, that's a that's a tricky case. We might want to unpack that a little bit more. Um, a lot of times, I, there's a theme shows up a lot in especially like fantasy and science fiction, the kind of imaginative storytelling where groups are brought together because of a bigger threat that we're able to we we get a shared we're on the same page about something. Um, and so we're able to work together. But these these kinds of, I, my little commentary on this is that I wouldn't put all of our eggs in that basket because there's always a the question of what happens when that threat is dealt with and what happened in World War II. After the Nazis were defeated, um, you know, there's the peace happening again, then we get the Cold War. So the fact that we're able to work together for some big threat uh, it can sometimes be a distraction from some of the higher issues of justice and, and well, social justice, uh, that we don't deal with those disagreements even if we're able to work together for this limited objective for a, a temporary period of time. Um, Mark said, uh, the way my children and their children's children will eventually lose Chinese culture simply by living in the United States. Yeah, this is another thing that is sort of interesting uh, from the article, maybe we want to pick up again on Wednesday, that um, the question of, of essentializing cultures, like that they have an essential identity to them that maybe needs to be preserved, there is a challenge to that of like maybe that that's just a, that's just not how cultures work. They're always evolving and changing. There is no like fundamental character that is like this culture. Um, that it, it's always in flux, and we don't need to somehow 
have some artificial view of how cultures work. Like this is inevitable. I think the there might be a point here, but maybe we can pick up on this again on Wednesday, is even if that's true, that cultures are always in flux and they're going to change, there can still be questions about how they change and whether that is happening in a just or unjust way. Anthony says, from personal experience, uh, if the dominant culture doesn't allow others to express themselves properly slash suppress the other culture, it causes a loss of the minority culture. I mean, my parents didn't teach me Spanish until I was five due to the negative connotations of speaking Spanish out loud in public. You notice how often language shows up as one of the continuums of advantage and privilege or disadvantage um, in the article. That is a, a, a definitely a major metric. It's, it's not just about cultural values, but also just like how that community operates with like say a language. Um, yeah, I, in terms of the co-opting of a dominant culture, what its ability to diffuse potential revolution, um, it can even happen when there is a voice, but how that voice is contextualized. Um, so it's not just about suppression too. Um, I think both of those things need to, to be put um, together. Yeah, so um, I really like a lot of the threads that we're getting started on here. Um, let me give you a code word today. Um, let's just do let's just do this. IDIC is the code word. IDIC. Um, that's our code word for today. Um, seems very relevant. Um, so let's do that. And the thing I mentioned earlier that I was going to touch on, yes, the disappointment. Um, so the average viewing length for my YouTube videos has been seven and a half minutes, which does not lead me to believe that people are watching all of the lectures. So I can't really do anything about this. I don't really have a lot of power over it other than to encourage you to watch them. I, even after the quarter is over, I, I don't give a fuck. I mean, grades or whatever. I, what I care about is your education. And I want you, you know, I've said from the beginning of the quarter, my commitment is to try to help you get the most out of the opportunity of this quarter working together. And I do think that the lectures we've been doing, especially since we switched online, are, um, are really valuable. Um, uh, we've we've covered a lot of really interesting material, in my opinion, uh, stuff that I think is worth studying and understanding and knowing about and thinking about critically. So um, I just wanted to make a, a I don't know what's this uh, encouragement to like engage with this stuff. Um, those again, like I said, those of you in the chat today, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir. You've been here. You've been watching all of the lectures live. So. I, I don't think you've been like shortchanging it, but um, you're less than half of the students we've got in the whole class. And people have been putting in code words, but I don't know if you're actually watching the whole video. So um, I, I mean, I'm not, I was, I was never going to move into a draconian way about, about this in terms of doing comprehension quizzes or something like that. But um, I just, I, I hope you get something out of this class. Um, and watching the videos, I, I hope, is helping with that. So I wanted to say something about that. Okay, um, that's it for today. I'll see you all on Wednesday, 9.30 to 11.30. It's a double period, so you get double attendance credit. Um, there's an option for an extra credit journal on, on the multiculturalism thing. Um, and I look forward to talking to all of you more. There's a, we got a, lot, a lot of can of worms opened up here, and uh, I hope we get to have some more conversations about it. I'm especially interested in hearing from you about what you think we should do about all this. Certainly what concerns you've got on the radar, the stuff about loss of culture, loss of meaning, I think is very, very interesting. But what should we do? What should we do about it is, is, is the kind of bigger and more difficult question. And I'm curious to hear what you think about that. And what maybe some of these positions from how, how your views sort of integrate with the way that uh, Sarah Song has been introducing and framing the intellectual discussion, the philosophical discussion. Okay. Hope to see you on Wednesday. Good luck with everything with finals. Let me know how I can help. I'm here for you. I want to talk to you. Um, so good luck. See ya.